Hello, everyone. Welcome to our conversation today, which I am calling Pilgrims Toward Planetary Consciousness, an Interfaith Dialogue on Faith in Action. My name is Claire Sims, and I am a graduate student at Yale Divinity School hosting this conversation as a part of a marvelous class called Islam at the Intersections, Readings in Liberation, Race, Gender, and Sexuality. And today we are going to be engaging another intersectional concern, and that is the environmental and climate crisis. And this is something that in mainstream discourse hasn't been thought of as an intersectional concern in many respects, but as a part of the movement to frame it as connected to social concerns, it has been reframed as climate and environmental justice. And that's the way I will be refer referencing it throughout this conversation. And a recent um, quote I heard that uplifts, I think a really valuable definition of climate and environmental justice is that climate justice means that those who are least responsible for climate change should not be the ones who suffer its gravest consequences. And so in this class, Islam at the Intersections, we have been thinking a lot about how justice concerns correspond to the issues experienced by those who are the most oppressed and marginalized by current and unjust structures. And today we want to think about how our faith is animating our response to those structures from the lens of environmental concern. And so today I am thrilled to have two guests with me to discuss the way their faith and traditions are living and growing alongside their concerns for and commitment to environmental justice. And without further preamble, I am thrilled to welcome Sister Joan Brown of the Order of St. Francis, who is Executive Director of New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light, and Mazir Zaibari, who is an active board member and practitioner of Islamic Sufism. As partners in this work, Joan and Mazir serve in distinct capacities with New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light, which is the local chapter of a national nonprofit, which brings together people of faith and conscience to work toward climate solutions and justice. The New Mexico chapter specifically articulates their work as guided by the core belief that active care of the natural world is integral to spiritual life and social justice. And I've had the privilege of working with both Joan and Mazir, and I know that they do incredible work mobilizing faith communities around a whole spectrum, spectrum of issues from oil and gas development and the just transition needed from a fossil fuel to renewable economy, to working with indigenous communities in New Mexico around the impacts of nuclear storage and uranium mining, and so much more that I'm sure we are going to hear about through the course of this conversation. So Joan and Mazir, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Clara, thank you so much. And Mazir also. I'm just looking so forward to this conversation today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Very excited. Thank you. So I thought that maybe we could start off our time with just a little bit more of an introduction. And if both of you would be willing to just share a little bit more about your faith background and maybe something formative that brought you to this work around climate and environmental justice. Uh, my name is Mazir, and I'm, uh, I think, practitioner is a little generous. Uh, I'm a, an attendee of the MTO Shalmas Sudi School of Islamic Sufism, uh, and I've been uh, volunteering on the board with uh, Joan at IPL. The, school, the MTO Shalmas Sudi School is a school of self-knowledge. It teaches us to uncover our uh, hidden treasures within ourselves. Uh, and... Uh, when we do that, when we discover this uh, inner harmony, it reflects as an external harmony, as a as a desire to improve our environment in the same way that we're improving ourselves. So that's what's brought me into this uh, sustainable and environmental work. Thank you. Mazir, that's just beautiful. I love it. Uh, so for myself, um, I guess, um, I, I just want to share, I have so much I could say, but just one little memory. So I am Catholic and often Catholics are Catholic by birth. They're Catholics forever. And so I grew up on a farm, a very rural area in Kansas and in the Catholic tradition. But what was very formative to me in that tradition, which um, was um, a practice that's no longer done, and I wish they were, but were um, spiritual practices, um, prayers, rooted in the body. So we would have, for instance, rogation days this time of year in May. 
and we would um, bless the fields and we would with water and uh, we would have processions with flower petals and prayers um, for Corpus Christi and all these bodily kind of things that were outside and within the natural world with our, our faith and with candles and uh, water, et cetera. And so I s felt at a very early age, this real connection with the earth, working with the earth as farm families and this spiritual tradition that was not separated from the earth. And so that's been very formative for me. Thank you. That's so interesting. I had I would not have imagined that taking place um, in Kansas. And that's, I, I agree. I, I think that's something that we should bring forth <laughs> more now. And, and both those, yeah, answers, I think, lead well into my first question, which is kind of informed by reading and thinking about the ways that I think that in faith communities, environmental concerns are often sort of siloed and they're not centered and kind of seen as like a, an add on to faith. And what I hear you partly gesturing to, Joan, is the way um, that has always connection to the earth and, and thinking about um, that connectivity has always really informed your expression of faith. And I'm curious as you now do this work in a very sort of community facing way, um, the different ways you're maybe seeing and struggling with how environmental justice is siloed or not thought of as connected to other elements of faith and how you have found ways to speak to people about those connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Clara, what you bring up is, is I think, a, a big challenge. And it is also um, uh, opportunity for growth, but it is a problem as well, because it is, I would say, with religious traditions, at least in my experience in working with interfaith, um, that the environment is siloed from Sunday worship, from spiritual practice. It's like, you know, um, and that is a problem. So in thinking about this, I was I was thinking in, in my work, what I've come to realize is that there's different phases of a religious tradition. So one is like institutional, and that's more the dogmatic or what's required. The other is the tradition, which I consider the mystical tradition, or that deep spiritual place um, that informs, and then the practice, which is the social justice and climate justice. And I think oftentimes um, people in religious traditions get stuck in the institutional part and don't realize the deep mystical uh, tradition that we have, like through in the Christian tradition, like Hildegard of Bingham and, and Claire, St. Claire and St. Francis and other contemporary saints like Berta Caceres, um, who was a martyr in Honduras, or Rachel Carson, or Dorothea Stang, who was an, a martyr in Brazil in the rainforests, and that those people lived what Pope Francis calls an integral ecology, which is, makes the connection with the social concerns as well as the um, environmental, and also as a whole person, um, uh, the, our, our sense, our need for community and spirituality. And um, just briefly, I'd like to just... Um, give an image that I think if we could grab onto this image, it would be so much so helpful um, in any traditions. Um, John Hodd, who's a theologian, talks about the estuary as the place, the source of greatest life in biological kind of systems where there's water. And he said, um, it's the estuary, not the source of the water, the beginning of the stream, the beginning of the water because the estuary holds the source. I think religious traditions often just keep looking to the source rather than seeing the source within the estuary or our world with all its joy, beauty, and great suffering and sorrows that we have now as we face um, species extinctions and climate change. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and in a moment, I think that'll bring us nicely to a conversation about sort of stewardship, because there's a lot of mining of like the source of scripture to try and understand of what is happening now. But Mazir, I'd love to hear just your thoughts on on any of this. Uh, in a way, sustainability and, and, and environmental 
uh, work is central to the teachings of the school in that uh, one of the main teachings that are currently the, the focus of, of the lectures for a while, in my understanding, is the knowledge of the seed. And this is likened to the, the divine knowledge that we're seeking in religion. Um, the seed starts out as a single point, uh, and based on the single point, you wouldn't predict what the seed is going to turn out to be. But based on its own internal source of knowledge, it uh, grows in stability and balance and harmony into this great tree with roots deep in the earth and with branches high in the sky. Um, so for us, nature serves as uh, as an example. So literally, it's central to our to the the teachings of the Antiochia Masudu school, um, and in my understanding. Uh, but also, this notion that we're seeking inwards, just like the seed is is basing every all of its growth on its own knowledge. This notion that we're turning inwards and that we're growing from uh, from from within and and cleaning up from within, and that reflects outwardly uh, to uh, environmental to environmental efforts. So, um, an example is that I see that when I uh, judge other people. For example, someone's giving a presentation and I think, wow, what an unprepared presentation. They're uh, <laughs> stuttering all over the place. Uh, the next time I go to give a presentation, I notice that this is how I perceive the audience. I perceive them as judging me. Or another example is if I'm a thief, I perceive everyone as a thief and I grab onto my things wherever I go. So in this way, the internal, uh, this, this, Inward seeking results in uh, cleaning things extra. So now I'm not going to hurt others because I know that it'll hurt me. I'm not going to steal from others because I know that it'll. Uh, so in this way, I think the teachings of the school relate to uh, environmental justice and sustainability as well. You know, <clears throat> Mazir, I just love that um, image uh, and of explaining your, you know, that aspect of your tradition as the seed and the internal part of that, and then growing into the tree. And um, which holds, like John Howe was saying, the source in the estuary, but it's larger than that. I just, I just love that. Um, and what I was, as you were talking, what came to me is that that seed is dependent upon the soil, the sun, the water, um, and the the microbes, and everything to become this tree and to continue to be that tree. And to me, what that was speaking of was community, which I think is essential in uh, uh, doing this work in, in, in being a spiritual person, is that deep sense of community, relationship, uh, reciprocity and relationship, respect, like you were saying, and understanding. And so I just, I just love that. Yeah, likewise. And I, I appreciate also how it brings in that, like in this sort of, I think in intersectional discourse, we tend to think of it in the community um, sphere, which it, it very much should be, but then how that also always reflects the individual in terms of like the inner and outer sort of spirit and psychological sort of understanding of the way every, every inner thought has outward expression. Thank you so much, both of you, for, for those answers. Um, yeah, I'm thinking that because it has emerged with such significance in all the readings I've done, both about um, Islam and the different ways the environmental crisis is being engaged there, as well as I know in Christian communities, I'd love to he hear your thoughts around the way um, stewardship, or is it Khalifa? Is that how to say I think that you word. might be more familiar with the term than I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fair. Um it's uh I've heard it um or read about it as vicinagency, vicin like kind of a, a very similar concept, I think, in many ways to stewardship, but maybe with some different inflections around a special responsibility humans have been given to maybe order the natural world and and as I think probably you both are very familiar with um, in terms of the kaleidoscope of faith sort of responses to environment, these are sort of the originary scriptural texts that people go back to over and over again. And 
I'm just, I'm really curious to hear some initial thoughts and maybe I'll hold back some of my own for now, but just the way you see these as useful categories um, or, or maybe the way you hold some challenges to that framework or think that there are maybe just more useful ways to start thinking about questions of how humans uh, do and ought to sort of relate to the environment. Um, I think in the as far as responsibility goes in the field of uh, religion, um, I think the the field of religion, uh, as defined by this school, in my understanding, is the the field of self knowledge, the field of really you know digging in there, uh, uprooting the the uh, digging the you know tilling the soil so that these things can grow um, within yourself, and I think that in itself is uh, a means towards addressing environmental and social concerns, social justice concerns, in a permanent and stable way. I think. Uh, Professor Nader Angla in the book Peace describes, uh, and I'll be again paraphrasing by my own understanding, describes that the, a harmonious society, for a harmonious society to exist, uh, what's required is for each of those members to find their own, uh, this, this harmony within themselves. Then they can exercise this harmony. But we've had systems of government, for example, systems of education, that try to force these things top down uh, or something of that sort. And that always, uh, it hasn't been successful yet. We can, we can at least say that. So I think, the, I think the key here, especially when it comes to the relationship between religion and this uh, environmental activism, this social justice uh, activism and getting people involved, the key here is to get people to, uh, to again, look inwards, find this inner harmony. Uh, and that will, uh, then the person wants for their society to reflect this inner harmony. They'll work towards that. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, Mazir, in your saying that, what, what came to my mind is what I think is probably a large question we face with climate change, and that is what does it mean to be a human being right now on the planet in this time? And I think that goes to understanding self the small self and the large capital self within larger community or in relationship to the um, universal mystery and the harmony with that uh, we need to have or come to. And I think that that's not a something set in stone, but it's continuing to grow. And that's why we're, you know, moving into now this, uh, what is human consciousness, which we didn't even really know that much about, um, you know, in scientific terms, I guess, until recent history. I mean, the mystics certainly did. So, um, in so I think that that and needs to reflect into deeper probings of some of, say, like the Christian or Jewish or other scriptures that um, continue to focus on stewardship, which I don't even use anymore because it it doesn't fit because we need to be in this reciprocal relationship and in community in that. And part of the problem is that we humans see ourselves, understand ourselves as superior or over or trying to manage everything. And um, while we need to be responsible, and there's some ethical principles for action in that, I, I think we need to look at our relationship uh, within the natural world within the universe as we are part of an expression of within the universe and um, and all is holy. Um, even though he lived, you know, centuries ago, Pope, uh, not Pope Francis, uh, Francis of Assisi, I think um, to me is kind of a guide, maybe because I'm a Franciscan, but he had that beautiful um, canticle of creatures that he wrote when he was next to death very depressed. He had said to God, please take me. I'm ready to go. I'm just suffering, which to me kind of can speak of some of the dark times we're in right now. But what happened is he, he didn't die. He was given this amazing canticle where he calls and he prays God through um, sister water, through brother sun, through um, brother wind. So those are not just nice titles. He knew and saw everything as this, um, uh, a familia or kinship as um, brother, sister, um, 
going to scriptures, I, I more and more, I just, in Christian tradition, I just go to the basic scripture, which says we're to love uh, God, neighbors, and ourselves, And that love, who is the neighbor? It's every single element, the water, the microbes, every everyone. And to me, that's different than a stewardship. It is a relational kind of model. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think for myself, I find more and more also that stewardship feels like, um, at least as it is now sort of applied and so susceptible to the logics of like colonization and a worldview in which humans are so much by default already seen as superior, um, that it becomes almost, yeah, kind of a, a dangerous word to just sort of reflexively always turn to without kind of as you're uplifting Joan, seeing ourselves as so deeply a part of creation. Like that's the first maybe mm -hmm. movement that needs to happen. And something that um, what you said, Mazir, made me think about in terms of how the inner self knowledge and that work will sort of like naturally bring forth the desire to see that reflected outwardly. Um, I've been in a class, Tribal Resources and Sovereignty, this semester with a professor from Hawaii, and he shared um, a cultural precept for his native peoples as um, kuleana, which means knowing oh. one's like particular responsibility and position in the world and, and how those um, very particular, that very particular placement of who you are kind of can then impact um, the world and community. And um, mm -hmm. I just appreciated, yeah, it reminded me of that and, and reminds me of the ways um, there's just, I think, so much more enrichment um, to come forth in these sort of interfaith dialogue spaces, which brings me um, to my... Can I just add one thing, Claire? Because th this goes back to, um, you know, this thought that I forgot to share, Mazir, when you talked about understanding the self and then harmonies will evolve or move from that. And it just reminded me of some a very specific example I heard this morning on the news. I've, I've been troubled by the movement of EV vehicles because I just think people are ignoring that, um, you know, the lithium batteries and all. And in this particular, and there's some hearings right now around EV vehicles, but um, this sort of said to me one reason for part of my uncomfortableness um, as well. Um, they were saying that people are wanting these larger and larger vehicles, SUVs, to be electric, and that even car companies, for instance, uh, Chevy is no longer going to have the Chevy Volt or a small vehicle with smaller batteries with less lithium because people want these big vehicles um, to make sure that they always have enough energy and big vehicles for maybe, uh, this is my interjection, two people, three people in this car, um, which says to me, not understanding ourselves or that harmonious relationship or who we are as human beings as it, within the universe. And so um, it has huge implications, I think. And religious traditions, I think, have a real opportunity and real deep responsibility to jump and not silo as they do the spiritual teachings outside of these larger um, realities that we're grappling with, with climate and species extinctions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that just so uplifts the way like economic, political, all these things have to be engaged um, at the spiritual level. And it reminds me of the quote, and maybe you know where this is from. I've heard it so many times and I feel that I don't know the source, but to live some simply so that others may simply live. Mm -hmm. And that that connection is I mm -hmm. feel very much missing in the discourse around um, a lot of the renewable energy and um, electric vehicle movement. Um, yeah, and so I would love to hear um, in this work um, maybe with interfaith power and light or or before and beyond that um how has it been to bring your particular faith tradition into interfaith spaces and um i would love to hear anything that you have found enriching surprising challenging um 
in those spaces as we kind of think about what they can offer in particular to this work? Uh, first, I, I'll just uh, mention a quote from Message from the Soul by Professor Sauderango that I was reminded of when you were speaking, Joan. Uh, guidance is in the union of thoughts, the heart, the senses, and nature, and going astray is and going astray is disarray and confusion among these four. Uh, that really spoke to me when we're talking about the inner uh, harmony and the outer harmony. Um, as far as uh, the what I've gained from these interfaces, one of the biggest things I've gained is. Uh, meeting, and I'm sorry to <laughs> to do this to you, not Joan, but meeting people like Joan, people who, uh, you know, we're we're doing this as part of our our self growth, as part of this journey of self discovery, participating in interfaith, and it teaches me, for example, uh, when I disagree with someone, it teaches me to look deeper into my own faith to see do I actually understand it? Does it actually make sense to me? And uh, what I was saying is part of it is seeing people like Joan in our charity and sustainability efforts. Uh, people who aren't just doing this as as some assignment, but are putting their entire lives into this effort. To me, that's been the most inspirational uh, inspirational thing. When we g give a donation somewhere, and we see uh, you know people who nine to five, seven days a week are are in service to their community. So that's one of the things I'm grateful for from all the interfaith efforts that I participated in. Thank you, Mazir. Um, you know, I have to say that I, I am just grateful for the diverse uh, thinking, prayers, um, perspectives of different spiritual traditions, um, you know, and doing this interfaith work. And that has enriched me. I've learned so much about Judaism, about um, Islam, uh, indigenous spiritualities. Um, and then I, not procreating, but somehow those influence me in how then I approach things. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I've just found more and more surprising, I feel something's evolving as people kind of have access to some of this wisdom and take it that our spiritualities individually, but also collectively are evolving to a new place and a, uh, a, a greater integration. And I feel I've, I've discovered that there's, there's a real hunger for some kind of spiritual, not just meaning, but at a deeper place that that can inform my presence in the world, can help create community where there's similar values, ethics. They, they may be different, but they're similar in terms of caring for uh, you know, uh, our communities, the common good, and for climate justice. Um, as for my own tradition, I, I think what I've discovered that has been our a Catholic tradition has lots of ritual mm -hmm. and is very rooted in water and soil and all these sacramentals and, you know, hands-on kind of things. And, and um, I guess because that speaks to me. So it's been, um, you know, a delight for me to see people embracing ritual and different mm -hmm. kinds of ritual embodied with earth um, and uh, prayer um, with, you know, of, for, for uh, climate justice and integrating that into advocacy, into action, so that we're not siloing our spiritual tradition into just prayer, but that praying is everything and it's breathing and it's eating, it's growing food, it's our advocacy, it's all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you both so much for those responses. Um, I, I really appreciate what you kind of named Joan around and, and Bazir as well around the, the evolving aspect of all of our faiths and also the sort of self-discovery um, and sort of deeper, um, maybe even digging deeper into one's own faith tradition and encountering others um, because one of the, I think, disservices done to faith and environmental work is when there's like an essentialization of like, this is, this is what all the Catholics think, or this is, you know, it's mm -hmm. not kind of holding that faith is always, um, always evolving, always multiplicitous and, mm -hmm. um, it can never just be sort of one voice speaking for 
an entire faith tradition. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And before I kind of move to a closing question, um, and, and no pressure if, if you don't want to speak to this Mormon's ear, but I wanted to just ask, you said that, that, that there were maybe times where maybe you found like challenge or disagreement that led you back to sort of go more deeply into something in your own um, faith tradition. And I'm curious if there's a specific example of that you might want to share. It's okay if not. We can totally move on to the next question. Um, And that is, what is giving you the most energy and hope right now in your faith practice as it speaks to the work of environmental justice? For for myself, I mean, actually, there is so much. Um, but because you're calling on faith practice in particular, I think just the deepening of my faith practices, like um, the uh, meditation, um, prayer in the morning. And um, since it's spring, I find in new ways that the birds are, um, you know, intervening in part of that all the bird song that starts at like 4 yeah. 30 um, you know it's like wow and that that's so holy and sacred and that's part of the prayer but i'm i'm you know although i, I know that and have known that it's kind of moving me on a deeper level so i think the practices that i normally do being open to how those move in a deeper level or like walking in the morning and um um the trees uh, greeting me with the sun and um, the beauty of God and, and, and the holy and that I'm in that and we're breathing the same back and forth transpiration uh, in, in our exchange of, of the oxygen or elements or carbon dioxide, um, you know, of working with diverse people um, and seeing that as a prayer and um, a, a, a communion. I'm, I'm exploring communion in a new way and in a deeper way. And that communion is everything and it's happening constantly. And it's this relationship and reciprocity and that that is nurturing, it's feeding, it's restoring, it's evolving, it's changing, it's growing, but that everything is communion. So I guess I'd have to say just new insights into um you know, um, spiritual thinking traditions and, and, uh, and also writers and, um, you know, different media things are, are part of that and poetry and even baking bread. It's all a matter of, as Mazir was saying, understanding myself within whatever I do and that harmonious and building the relationships. Um, and uh, I think we need that so much. I just, I'll, I go back to so much Thomas Berry and something that he said in terms of as we, um, quote, use up the resources that we have, that we need to dig more deeply into the spiritual psychic resources that we do not even know we have in order to move into the future, to be able to be of, of, of service to live in that harmonious way, you know, um, in the universe and on, with earth and community. That's beautiful. Thank you, John. How about you, Mazir? Yeah, I think the, the work that's being done uh, by interfaith groups is certainly something that uh, every uh, student of religion, every seeker of religion is involved in, something that every seeker of religion would do. But I think doing it in an interfaith community has a huge multiplicative effect, doing it with people who are uh, seeking the same things, who are on their own spiritual paths, uh, is is really a huge blessing. There's so much to learn from that, uh, not only from the activities we do, but from the, the people that we're doing them with, another thing that's to be grateful for. Um, well, both of you um, are part of what gives me energy and hope and, and this work that you're engaged in. And I guess I'll, I'll offer a bit of a response as well that um, the experience of um, being in the course that I referenced around tribal resources and sovereignty has um, led me to think a lot more about not an entirely new concept, but um, just in a deeper way 
the places in the Christian scripture and Hebrew Bible that I find more fruitful to turn to than maybe Genesis are the different um, prophetic accounts where oftentimes the land is responding to the ways that people are living and there's like the trees clap their hands or um or there's so there's like there's lament there's celebration and something that has really emerged so clearly in the class around tribal resources and sovereignty is the way um, native peoples understand the land as having such agency and um there's a, a new word to me called survivance that um, we read about an application to fish species resisting um, different colonial life ways like the dams and different things harming harming their ways of living and not just that the fish are trying to survive for themselves but for the native peoples who um, they've been in this res- this relationship of reciprocity with for thousands of years and um, the idea that the that the land is sort of resisting with us, yearning with us for the reflection of the harmony and the balance and the reciprocity um, gives me a lot of hope. Um, and to to sort of get out of the human silo, if you yeah. will, yeah, and remember that. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you both so much. Well, I feel like we could keep talking. and We, we could. Is there one more story? Because you, what you're saying, Clara, brought up something. I just yes, last please. night on Nova, or was it? No, it was Nature. And I just loved it. Um, it was um, a whole a, a whole program uh, by uh, the British gentleman. What is his name? He's worked for- David Randy. Attenborough? Yes, Attenborough. And his, um, his work with song mm. throughout the world, including the humpback whales, the birds- but there was this one little segment of a bird that he had uh, recorded. He had seven sounds that he's recorded since he was like a teenager, basically, up to his 90s that were significant. Mm-hmm. One of them was this bird called the lyre bird, which lives in um, Australia. And this bird um, is called the lyre bird because it has, the male has all these songs that it does of other birds. Oh. <laughs> and the reason is because um, it's for mating to show the female that it, it, it can protect her and it does all, it's really very complex. But one of the songs it took on was the chainsaw buzzsaw of wow. deforestation. And you heard this chainsaw sound coming out of this bird, but mm-hmm. he, he he was using it to, you know, sort of dissuade to say, I can protect you. That's a threat out there. You need to come to me. <laughs> Create more babies. Uh-huh. But, but it's it's what you were saying is what mm-hmm. the natural world does. And um, anyway, just a little aside. It was amazing. Yeah, that is very, very fascinating and very humbling, I think, as we think about, yeah, stewardship and that we order the world some somehow um to yeah to have the humility to know that the yeah all all of life is um a part of of this inner and outer balance harmony dynamism that we're all uh, seeking well i want to just honor your time and thank you so much for for being here like i said i feel like we could keep talking and just in being in this conversation, it, it energizes me in in this work. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to continuing to be conversation partners 